Good morning, Frank. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Becky. So this morning, um, Frank's going to take us through uh, his amazing operations at Kilimanjaro, um, the place that Adventure International was born all those years ago. Um, we're, I'm really excited to get into the detail of all the different ways you can climb Kilimanjaro, the ways that you're different, and you know what buyers should know um, about trying to sell this to their consumers. So um, take take it away, Frank. Yeah, thanks, Becky. Um, you know, yeah, this sort of is the genesis of how we started. Um, a couple a couple of young guys got together in Tanzania and decided to start a Kilimanjaro climbing company. And now it's been over a decade that we've been supporting uh, travel agents and tour operators around the world to get their clients to actually this view right here, uh, sort of the top of, uh, of Africa. Um, so we'll kind of go through a little bit here in terms of climbing Kilimanjaro. Uh, we, when we started this trekking operation, we really, at the beginning, kind of had set out, it was like really cool to have like an adventure travel company. And we were all young, we we're making livings off of doing this. And then as we started really embedding ourselves in making a difference uh, in these communities, we decided that we would really try to create really a very ethical trekking company um, with just adhering to the most highest standards of safety and really a dedication to training, helping porters who were interested in becoming guides, have an internal process where we help them essentially empower themselves to move up in terms of the company. So uh, I don't know, we kind of found that this was a little bit of, a, of an opportunity for us to really do some good and really use travel to do good. And I think that we've maintained a really high standard um, for the past decade. And I think that's why people decide to use us. So um, in terms of ethics, we have essentially been paying the highest wages of any company in East Africa. And that's like a really big accomplishment. We're really proud of that. Um, we have very low turnover. So most of the people that have been working with the company have been with us for a decade. Um, they get paid very well. Um, and so, you know, crews are happy and clients see that difference on the mountain. Most of the feedback is like, oh my gosh, it's kind of hard to describe through emails and on paper, just the energy of the crew. And, you know, so um, these, these folks are really committed to being a support, a lifeline. I just want to clients. jump in there, Frank, because I see this with um, hiking and trekking and trips in general around the world, that when a DMC operator pays their staff well, their guides well, all, all of the staff, you know, even the behind the scenes staff, that, that then you get consumer clients coming back saying it was amazing, the interaction with the guides and the local people and how much they are so loyal and love the company that they work for and to get that kind of feedback back i think is is wonderful and it and it it's truly you know one of the most important things i think and i think buyers forget that in terms of negotiating prices and seeing mm. the value in who they're working with and really checking who they're working with and how they treat the people on the ground so well done i think that's yeah. just brilliant yeah i mean listen you're right so I've had interactions with companies that have sort of tried to price hound us for give us your lowest rates. And I've actually had to probably deny, I would say like millions of dollars of potential business because there's just a certain point where you can't really start to sacrifice lowering wages for crew. Because let's be real, the directors aren't going to suffer. These are people who are working on the ground. And so... Um, for us, it's just really important that people are very, very well taken care of. And so we've been doing that um, since the beginning. Um, safety is something that's just so huge. We have like a internal uh, AMS score checking document where we're doing pulse oximetry readings. Our guys are always communicating with the clients. 
And essentially for us, you know, I see websites now that are like, we have supplemental oxygen to get you to the summit. Honestly, I feel like that's just, I mean, if, if you're giving, if you're administering oxygen to a client, that's an emergency. That is not good. A client should be on their own two feet, heading to the summit, capable, not, hey, here's oxygen assistance to get you to the top. I mean, we're not, this is Kilimanjaro. We're not talking about Everest where, you know, you need oxygen to get to the summit. So um, we don't do things like that. So for us, there's no flashy, hey, let's get you to the summit by doing this. For us, it's like, let's get you to the summit safely on your own two feet. And if that's not possible, our guides are going to make the decision to get you down. You know, we're trying to eliminate this whole kind of hoopla around, let's get clients to the summit so we can get a bigger tip because that does happen. And what that creates is um, that's dangerous. It's really dangerous. So what I, here's my, here's my, here, my request for agents and tour operators to their clients is to really do a little homework around trekking companies who've invested in their crews. They're probably not the cheapest company. They're probably charging a little bit more, but it makes a difference on the mountain. You know, you start price hounding, you start doing the cheapest stuff. Things happen, you know. Yeah, and Things then you're happen. putting you're putting the staff in 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 a precarious position too, as well. It's not just about the consumer and people who are there, um, but it's also then the people who have to look after them, and then also the other clients that are on that trip with them. You know, they have to be looked after. They might not be able to summit. So there's all sorts of knock on effects if you've got the wrong people climbing that shouldn't be climbing. Um, so that's really important. Yeah. We take it seriously. We really do. We take all this like very, very seriously. And so, you know, there's a lot of attention to detail. There's a lot of consistency. There's a lot of systems in place. Really what that ensures is that you're getting consistent product, quality of product all along the way. Um, and as mentioned earlier, um, there is a dedication to training. And so during the low season, we will do... Um, wilderness first responder classes and courses. We will do money management. We will do HIV testing. Um, there's basic first aid. There's like, let's refresh the menus and doing cooking classes. So, uh, you know, maybe there's like a little bit of a, hey, these porters now want to move into like a crew position or, hey, we want to add on some cooks or this porter wants to be an assistant guide. Where is he? in terms of the world of moving up in the in the ranks, so to speak. A lot of the guides actually start off as porters that we have. And that's actually really nice because then there's a lot of empathy and compassion for the porters. They really are a team. Sometimes it's a little hard when there's like hierarchy and there's a guide that came in and he was never, you know, a porter. And so there might be a little bit of like, that's you know, a again, hierarchy. Point. So, yeah, I love that. And yeah. I love that your training is quite is very holistic. It's not just about wilderness, you know, and safety training. It's about money management, how brilliant and HIV and health. Um, that's fantastic. English classes. So that that yeah, that's brilliant. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, you want people to be better off at the end of the day. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's kind of a goal here. Uh equipment, I mean, I think we've hundreds of thousands of dollars millions of dollars maybe at this point um in terms of of gear so really really important to just have the best gear i would say that we run the highest specification on the mountain um you know we actually created that for a couple companies and so we've got you know a vip specification that has bed cots and showers and and all that stuff and i think we've got a little slide here where i can break yeah. down a little bit more of the equipment um so as mentioned you know we've got 200 plus team honestly wow i think at this point it might be 300 to be honest with you so um the ratios are big it's like one to seven so i think people are usually pleasantly surprised at how much crew comes up to support them I always kind of joke that it's like a village that's coming up with you to to help you. Um, but we really, I mean, for us, it's like there's no overloading. We're not cutting corners. If we need to, you know, staff more porters for the climb, we're doing it. I mean, this literally this trekking operation exists to employ people. That's it. 
And if that's not in the line of people wanting to get, climb with us, then, you know, they're choosing not to. But that's that's what we're up to. We even do resupplies like halfway through the climb with fresh food, more porters, you know, yeah. so. And we forgot to mention um, that the training that you do also includes guides that, that freelance and they work for other companies. So you're spreading that professionalism and that training wider than just your own full time staff as well. Yeah, that's that's right. So we do at our offices hold wilderness first responder courses for other guides of other companies. So, I mean, the thing is this, uh, I always like to say the following because it is important. I don't know. I don't really feel like we have this like worthy end all be all attitude. I think that there's several like top, maybe like, I don't know, five to eight companies. They're all doing an amazing job. And it's about really taking care of people. So there's, there's a lot of times where some of our porters and guides have gone to help assist clients of another company. Um, because at the end of the day, it's about creating safety on the mountain. Yeah, so, it's about and it's about um, protecting Kilimanjaro as a as a place and a destination and a community where people can keep coming way into the future, right? Yeah, it's true. Something's happening on the mountain. I mean, you're, you're going to help. You're yeah. going to help people. There's mm -hmm. also been like advice given by some of our guides to another maybe like a more junior guide who is maybe on one of his first climbs and the clients aren't doing well. Some of our guides will say, hey, listen, I don't think that these guys should continue, you know, and so making decisions to really keep people safe. That's great. Um, just a lot around training. <clears throat> so in terms of safety, um, yeah, there's like this saying that we have that all clients must be able to walk off the mountain themselves. So I mean, I can really count the amount of times where we've actually had to maybe put a client on a stretcher and like walk them down. It's very rare that we ever get to that point. Um, most clients can walk themselves. They might need a little assistance, but they most clients should be able to walk themselves off the mountain. Kilimanjaro is a very traditional mountain where you just start walking down and your body just immediately starts to feel better you really just want to get off the mountain so um on kilimanjaro the best way is you just walk down vehicle meets you and off you go to a hospital do a little checkup oftentimes people just want like a really nice hot shower and, and, and this is talking about when okay. people don't feel well right <laughs> not every yeah yeah <laughs> no yeah this is just when people don't feel well yeah. i mean to be honest with you because we have such a rigorous safety protocol and yeah. we're like highly communicative with clients um we have a very high summit success rate not because we're like the best but really just because people are really well looked after yeah. and people are looking at the markers and indicators we also focus on routes that are a little bit longer give the benefit of the doubt for clients so you know summit success rate is pretty high because uh, we look after people. So, uh, you know, you start doing those shorter routes, try to push people, people just get sick. They start to feel like crap. Um, so, you know, there is supplemental oxygen, there's sat phones, there's neck braces, um, tons and tons of, of kit. Um, so we do, we do everything on the mountain, to be honest with you. If someone says, hey, we want to do X route, we do it. Uh, I would say that the primary routes on Kilimanjaro that we focus on would be Lamosho, which comes in via the western side of the mountain. And then you've got Machame, which is also known as the whiskey route. I don't know why, but uh, Machame actually syncs up with Lamosho route. Uh, and then we also focus on Rongai, which is on the eastern side of the mountain. And... I don't know if I'm able to, uh, hmm, I thought I might have a little pointer, but anyways, other routes uh, that are available on the mountain are the Morongo route, which we really try not to focus on. Um, there's Umwe route, uh, there's a Londorosi route. So there's actually a ton of ways to climb Kilimanjaro, but I would say that we focus on like three primary routes. So from these routes, you've got a couple summit points. So Lamosho and Machame, which we focus on, 
they both congregate at Stella Point. Stella Point is about 45 minutes from the summit. So really at that at those altitudes, I mean, 45 minutes to the summit is quite nice. It doesn't, I mean, it feels long when you're up there, but if you're going to do Rongai route, which on the, is on the Eastern side, you come up via Gilman's point and Gilman's is about an hour and a half to the summit. So, so what, what kind of, and, and these points are like points before it gets much steeper. Is that the, is that the idea? that No. Be... So it's, it's like a crater. So you've, mm-hmm. you you kind of come up to these, these points and then you walk to the true Uhuru Peak Summit. Right. So really you've been climbing and then you've got these points and then from the points you get you go to the summit. Right. So it's essentially just a walk to the summit. It's not that it gets crazy from there. You've right. actually, once you, once you reach Gilman's Point and Stella Point, that's a good sign. That means you've done like most of the hard work. Hard work. But ah, okay. because of the altitude, yes. you know, you're getting to like 19,000 plus, every step is like, okay, big breaths. So the reason that we like to focus on Lamosho and Machame is because you do get to Stella Point and you're 45 minutes away. Mm-hmm. So it's a little closer to, to the summit. Um, we have some start and descent points charts. So uh, one thing to mention would be that we do focus a lot on private camping. So there are companies that like to sell on the Morongo route because there's huts there. I personally think that those huts are a nightmare. They're very crowded. Sometimes the porters are left out without any accommodation. And it's basically the same route going up and going down. Mm -hmm. It's really not that pleasant. So we focus on other routes where we can set up private camps for clients. And so what we do is usually we'll send a runner early in the morning to go get a really beautiful campsite. And by the time clients arrive, everything is set up. We were a little bit away from the pack. And that's really the way to do it. It's more private. It's more intimate. Listen, is are there people on Kilimanjaro? For sure. It's Kilimanjaro. It's like probably one of the most famous mountains in the world. A lot of people attempt it. It's very doable. But there's ways to do it where it doesn't feel so busy. It's such a big mountain that it doesn't feel overcrowded. Um, a lot of times we'll suggest like shoulder seasons for clients too to go climb so that it's less busy essentially July and August like the entire planet because it's summer vacations is Mm -hmm. the busiest that's just when it's the busiest outside of that you've got some nice shoulder seasons Um, so in terms of routes that we were sort of alluding to our go-to is Lamosho eight days this route for us has been just monumental in our summit success rate. When people say, hey, what's the best route? What's the amount of time? Without a doubt, without a question, Lamosho eight days. Some people might go Lamosho nine days. We kind of strayed away from that because it has a really high crater camp overnight, which is at like 18,000 plus. It's not, we found that a lot of people weren't feeling that well. so. Lamosho eight days, um, scenically, amazing ascent profile, uh, good time for acclimatization. That's the way to go. Uh, if people are a little bit shorter on time, maybe even a little bit shorter or sorry, tighter on budget, then we'll go into Machame seven days. Machame seven days is an amazing, amazing route. It actually joins the Lamosho eight day route. So um, for us, it's also an amazing ascent profile. So for other people, for folks who are looking to do something maybe a little different, maybe a little less crowded, then we do suggest that people do Rongai seven days. It also has an amazing ascent profile. Uh, it's considered a little bit more off the beaten track. Uh, although just to be really honest, you know, Africa, it can get busy. So Rongai now is not so off the beaten track. But for us, these are like the three go, go-to go routes. There's other like more mountaineer routes that we're exploring now. Um, but I think for your, I don't know, let's just say your average person who wants to try Kilimanjaro, they're probably going to do a nice safari after and they want to try it. They have a decent level of fitness. These are your go-to routes. 
That's great. And I just want to highlight again the phrase about the ascent profile. And the, the point of this is that it's a gradual, a nice ascent gradually to get used to the altitude so that your body copes with the altitude better. And hence the Lamosho eight day. I love that point about the nine day is actually not as great, even though it's longer <clears throat> because you're camping at such a high altitude. And the eight day works better because you camp lower and then you make it to the top and back down. Have I understood that correctly? <laughs> yeah, so that is kind of the point. So during these climbs, there's like a go high, sleep low type of philosophy so that your body essentially is adjusting to the altitude. So like me medically, scientifically, the ascent profile that most people do on Kilimanjaro is actually too fast. Nobody really on the planet is like 100% really good. Some people have a little bit of a headache, a little bit of a tummy thing. Hey, I haven't gotten much sleep because I'm camping every night. So there's a little something. You still are in the mountains. You still are dealing with altitude. So mm -hmm. we're just going to try to give you the best scenario possible under the circumstances. Mm -hmm. A lot of people ask about, you know, altitude um, medicine like Dimox and things like that. So we'll listen, I think if people want, yeah, if, if people want to take that, sure. Is it a make or break? Mm, not really. I think it, it's like a net positive. So for folks who want to take it, great. The thing is, is you kind of have to commit. So if you are going to take time off, start taking it and just commit to taking it for the climb. Don't halfway through say, oh, okay, now I'm going to start taking time off. It doesn't work like that. So we get a ton, a ton of questions around Dimox, so I just thought I'd, I'd bring it up. Yeah, so not to go too far into pharmacology. But, <laughs> that's um, another webinar. <laughs> yes, yeah, that's another webinar. So you've got, what's really interesting about Kilimanjaro is that you have all of these different like ecosystems and zones. You're going from like essentially a rainforest into, well, I guess you'd say, it's bushland into rainforest, then into this heat zone, and then into the alpine, and then it gets Arctic. I mean, it's wild because most people think of Africa. First of all, most people think of Africa as this like dry desert. Mm -hmm. Tanzania is actually equatorial. It's actually very, very lush. And the soil is extremely fertile. So it's actually very different than what people think. Um, but it is really wild that you get up into this Arctic zone with like glaciers and you're in Africa. So really at the end of the day, Kilimanjaro is really, really beautiful. It's a very, very beautiful mountain and highly, highly worth it. So in terms of weather, uh, what I'd like to say about this is that really Tanzania, the way that it works is there's just, there's rainy season. So months like November we try and stay away from heavy rains and then April and May is also there's rain what's kind of wild is that like I feel like now we don't really have like a low season because I think people climb year round and they just know that it might just be more wet um at, and at the top of Kilimanjaro it'll, it'll snow but personally I really do try to st stay clear of those rainy seasons for mm. just for client comfort. Yeah. And like I said, most people, I don't know, 75% of people um, usually will do a safari after Kilimanjaro. And so in terms of like the rainy season and going to see animals, not that ideal. So mm. Great. So in terms of our gear, uh, we have three different specifications. So uh, we have a, what we call like a lightweight or like standard. Um, this is probably our most like budget conscious specification. And this is, I don't know, I would say that this is maybe for folks who are a little younger. Maybe we've had like some student groups or just for people who are like really hardcore mountaineers and they just like want no frills. Okay, give me the give me the basics. I need a crew. I need food. I need tents. I need support because it's actually illegal to climb Kilimanjaro without hiring a tour operator. This is our most like standard 
specification, which I have to say is actually probably what a lot of companies do on Kilimanjaro. And that's probably like our low tier. We include a portable toilet, no matter what, no matter what specification, we include a portable toilet. And so, the safety um, things are all the same as well, we should say, right? And that's the thing. At the end of the day, you're still going to have a great guide. You're mm -hmm. still going to have all of the safety protocols in place. That doesn't waver. So I would say that all, the, the specification that a lot of people will do is the luxury specification. So now we're talking about a bigger client tent. We have these custom-made three-inch mattresses on the floor. We include sleeping bags. There's a thermal liner. There's a pillow. We have a dining tent. We have table. We've got back chairs. Um, you know, we're doing French press coffee. This is our really our go-to, what I would say is like our quintessential specification for most people. Mm. Now, we do have a VIP specification. This specification is for folks who probably don't want to sleep on the ground. So we have bed cots that, that have a mattress with a sleeping bag, pillow, and liner bigger, more like walk-in size guest tents, a bigger dining tent. We include a shower tent. And so it's definitely probably one of the top specs on the mountain. And to be honest with you, it's actually quickly kind of becoming one of our most popular specifications. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, at the, end, at the end of the day, uh, I th we actually do our Lamosho eight days in the VIP specification is what we do for our set departures. Right. And so um, we are, our company overall does a lot more FIT custom travel. However, for Kilimanjaro, what we found was that there were ones and twos of different companies that wanted to climb Kilimanjaro. So we actually created some set departures. And actually those go every Sunday of the year on Lamosho eight day. So. And just to come back to that slide, Frank, just for a second. Sure. Um, talking about the food. I mean, when we're talking about summit success too, I imagine that the food, the quality of the food that people eat, um, what they're drinking, et cetera, is really important too. And I mean, I imagine the kind of food that you're eating at those three levels is different, but that the quality is really good. Yeah, so here's the thing about Tanzania. Actually, there's fruit, fresh fruit and veg in the country, which is amazing. Like you actually have really amazing access to good food. So really what varies here is we, I would say that we do really phenomenal food. So I kind of help create the menus early on, early days. And we do breakfast, lunch, and dinner, of course, and coffee and tea, and we provide all the water. So food is going to be really, really good. I would say as you start getting into like the luxury and VIP, there's a little bit more frills. Like, you know, what we put out for snacks are probably a little nicer, right? Rather than your like popcorn and peanuts, we might have like hummus or like guacamole or something, you know, there's a little bit more because the specification is a little higher a little bit more budget, you can start to bring a little bit more extras. Maybe on the luxury and VIP, um, we do like a pumpkin soup because like, you know, a porter had to bring up that actual pumpkin. Whereas in the lightweight, probably no pumpkin soup. We're trying to like probably not bring up that pumpkin and extra costs. So that's really what changes. Oh, things like um, instead of maybe fresh pressed coffee, the lower specification might have more instant coffee, things like that. So I mean, yeah. we're getting so nuanced, but like maybe the upper echelon, like the specifications has actual Heinz ketchup, you know, <laughs> the lower specification has local ketchup. It's right. really interesting though. I literally have sat with spreadsheets of looking at budgets and like the things that you do to make sure that you can reach these price points, you know? So right. those are, I don't know, examples of how, yeah. of how it varies. No, it's helpful. Thank you. Yeah. So this, this, this picture kind of shows maybe what like a typical camp setup would be. You got your dining tent, you have the guest tents over there, that blue tent in the corner is going to be your, your toilet tent. Um, this is another wow. view as well. This is up in the, in the crater. Uh, and so 
Yeah, this will give you a view of what is the luxury specification. So you can see how you have that mattress, you've got the pillow, you've got the sleeping bag, and the thermal liner. So we use mountain hardware tents. I feel like we were one of the first companies to to use these. A lot more companies got on board, so you'll see other people with, with these tents now. Um, and then we just love these space stations and strongholds, these like kind of eco-dome looking tents for, for the dining. Um, and I feel like this slide's a little hard to, to see, but anyways, what, what this slide brings up is examples of what the menus would be like. So, you know, for, for breakfast, there's things like cereal and porridge, a selection of fruits. Uh, we do things like bacon or sausage, we do eggs. And then for lunch, um, usually that's taken en route. There's a couple days where maybe we always, if we can, we'll try to do lunch in camp if possible, like a hot lunch. But in terms of, you know, when you're on trail, there's things like fruit juice and some fresh vegetables and fruit. You do something like a sandwich, uh, maybe like a little chocolate bar, things like that. We really try, the guys kind of quickly get to the point and whip up uh, a little fresh soup. So we do a lot, a lot of soups for sure, because it's easy for your body to digest. Mm. So if people are usually kind of getting a little tummy or not feeling well, your body can usually digest soup. And at least that way you're getting caloric intake. And because the thing is, is you gotta eat. If you're, if you don't eat, your body is not gonna do well. So you just try to do, you try to do your best. Some people, massive appetites, some people not really, just kind of depends. Um, and then in terms of dinner, uh, again, more soup, nice soup, um, you know, maybe accompanied with like bread. We do things like rice, things like pastas, uh, usually do like the vegetables. Um, there's definitely a protein dish. And then we do some kind of dessert as well. And then there's always hot chocolate, tea and coffee. So um, some of the main things for us is no frozen food. So mm -hmm. there's nothing that's frozen. Uh, we don't do like, you know, um, there's like packets of soup that you can just mix with boiling water. We don't do that. So we do fresh. Everything that we do is fresh soup. Um, and again, we, you know, we resupply every single climb, bringing fr fresh fruit, fresh veggies. Um, and the resupply is kind of key. There's been times where, hey, these guys love bacon we got to bring extra bacon or hey <laughs> these mean. guys love yeah love <laughs> peanut butter i mean they are mean. plowing through the peanut butter bring more peanut butter so the resupply comes halfway through to make sure that you know we're stocked up because sometimes you kind of read clients and you know you kind of do your traditional stuff but then all of a sudden you know um clients are kind of moving through certain things a lot I mean it, it all just shows how logistically challenging and you know how many people are involved and you know it's quite it's quite the feat isn't it it is it's exciting I mean listen <laughs> we've built a lot of systems we've built a lot of systems around this so yes. this kind of seems like second nature but I could see how for someone who was you know doesn't know what's going on it's like whoa this is like this is like an expedition it's you make a, it look easy basically yeah. it's a serious undertaking you yeah. know i like spent time figuring out you know going to the market i mean it's kind of wild i used to like go to the market haggle with the mamas for avocados get the climbs <laughs> prepared that's so not my world now but you know back in the day yeah um so there's also there's a lot of questions around um and I understand that we're kind of just moving through a little bit of like an overview, little kill the jar presentation. We provide like a 50 page information pack. So there, I know that there's a lot of questions around Kilimanjaro. There's a lot to cover, but just to kind of go through a little bit, um, there's usually a ton, a ton of questions around getting prepared for Kilimanjaro. So, I mean, like, I can't imagine the amount of times that someone has been like, I don't know if I could like physically do this. Like what is like the measure of doing Kilimanjaro? Well, the truth is, is that I think that if people have a good cardio routine and are getting fit with their cardio and they are doing like hikes on the weekend, or maybe they have done other slightly challenging hikes before, 
and people are committed to getting fit before Kilimanjaro, mm. I think it's doable. I think I think you've got really high chances of I mean, actually summiting Kilimanjaro. We because... haven't mentioned yet, but what's the um no. what's the altitude? What's the summit? What's the altitude? Night. It's nineteen thousand one hundred thirty-five. So feet. Um, <clears throat> feet. Yeah. Which is so, what in meters? Oh gosh, I don't know in meters. This is what I need, Ben. My UK. <laughs> I'll work it out. Uh, yeah. So. You know, I think that this mountain is really doable. And you, at, at the end of the day, I think people just need to be committed to to getting mm. fit. So there's no, I mean, and if you've done other big challenging mountains, you might find yeah. Kilimanjaro not to be so difficult. Mm. Um, in terms of, you know, obviously we provide like full detailed gear lists, but oftentimes what you find with, with kit is, it's all about layers on Kilimanjaro. So, you know, bringing enough layers where you can take something off if you're getting too hot or, hey, I've got like a vest that keeps me kind of cool as like the wind is hitting. I mean, it's seriously like the weather can change in, in a moment's time up there. Wind, it's really sunny. Whoa, I'm like in the shade. Now I'm really cold. So yeah. it's all about having layers up there. And uh, I think I already, I, I kind of brought up Daimok, so I'm not going to really go into that um yeah a lot of times it's about when people think about like jackets and what they need to bring for the summit bid and things like that you're kind of just wearing like your ski clothes and oftentimes your friends might have like a um you know a, a closet with extra stuff to to bring over mm -hmm. so that is the one thing it's hard to find gear in tanzania so we really ask people to just like source this wherever they live you right. know so um, this is a nice little shot of our champagne finish that we give clients, um, no matter if they summit it or not, you know, they made it back. So we'll always greet, uh, people with a champagne finish, but don't tell people that this is a surprise. So. Secret. <laughs> it, yeah. It's That's a, great. It's a surprise, so, um, yeah, so that's, that's us. That's brilliant, that's Frank. Thank you so much. That was absolutely fascinating and just i think it's just Wait, so useful to know the details when you i went it. back to this because it's five eight nine five meters. <laughs> yeah fantastic brilliant frank and of course if people want to talk in more detail they can get in touch and set up a private training session for them their teams ask as many questions as they want and also find out from you what else you offer in Tanzania. I know you do the hiking to Lake Natron, the glamping there. You do yeah. hiking safaris. You do all sorts of things across Tanzania to mix with Kilimanjaro. Um, that's right. So, you know, we do a lot of adventurous stuff um, in Tanzania. And so after Kilimanjaro, there can be biking safaris. There could be more trekking if you want, um, walking safaris. So there's there's so much to do, so much to in, do. in Tanzania. So Brilliant. thank you yeah. so much again for your time, Frank. All right. Well, thank you.